Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Friday Hacks, uh, to everyone. Uh, it's our second last Friday Hacks lesson. And today we have a key that also a lot of that is going to be online from Frank and Belly, right? And yeah, I think we can start with our first talk from Keith. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi, I'm from Frank and Belly. I have a few automatic child grounding robot as a starting point. So, this is our robot, data app. I think that's a target or try to try to carry it because you always type that this is a relatively lightweight robot that can be carried by one person rather than me. This is about 17 kilos unladen. Um, and yeah, it's meant to be very portable. And a lot of people say it looks like a hot body pocket. So because of its colorfulness. So today's topic is on how to make robotics or hardware robotics startup in a reasonably cheap way. The first step is to use robotic arm if you can. So robotic arms are very expensive. People always have the idea that, oh, uh, you have a robotic arm company, you have to use a, a, um, they just think about a robotic arm, but that's not, that's not necessarily true. A universal robotic arm is very universal and it's very versatile, but then it has many degrees of freedom that is very accurate on. The cost of that would be much higher than what you would get if you were to get, not if you were to build a purpose-built robot, in this case, like ours. And so, we are looking at a robotic, an industrial robotic arm carrying on payload, uh, costing about 40,000 US dollars. And spoiler, our robot costs about 4,000 US dollars. So, including assembly. So, this is the is cheaper, and this allows uh, union economics to work much better. So, my talk will be quite a bit more on economics, on the economics part of robotics. So, the reason why we started off with building tau grounding robots is because we were looking at things that we can go to make. And we realized that, hey, you know, the contract industry is like centuries old, using centuries old technology. I'm not sure if it's one just invented or even troll is invented, it's probably a few thousand years ago. And within the contract industry, Tarling had created union economics because Tarling are considered one of the highest paid uh, laborers in, um, the contract in, in the contract industry. And thus, we believe that whatever that we uh, would be would have would be great value. And also, how grounding does Tarling's case and that? And thus, um, power grounding, the automation of power grounding is not just beneficial for um, ourselves and um, our clients, but also beneficial, beneficial for the workers, especially in the next day. So you can see over here our robot um, consists of our grounding mechanism and our cleaning mechanism. So if we're to do grounding and, sorry, can I have a few of Anyone knows what power grounding is? Anyone don't know what power grounding is? Ah, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I should have put that. I should have said that. So, power grounding is a process of building up the gas in between power when there's no power that are getting outside that with power. So, you can see over here, right? Um, before I enter this industry, I didn't know that you have to look out the house. I thought you lay the house and that's it. But no, you lay the house and there are gas in between the house. And the gas are put are there for the purpose to uh, account for extended contraction. And so, um, that's why you need to have ground, uh, ground for the house. You can't have like, you can't, you can't lay the house side by side um, throughout. So, um, grounding is a process that is very laborious because you can see that guy is putting one ground in between house. Yeah, that's about it. So, instead of the guy putting on ground and then cleaning off, etc., you have um, a robot doing it. So, this is the grounding mechanism, and then you have the cleaning mechanism behind over here. And um, they, there's a point up here, I'm not sure if anyone can see this, but they try to get this up. So, you can see the point ground that we leave it. So this pins up that has ground. So you can imagine this whole robot will align with the floor, as in with the ground line, and then you have the solid ground to clean up the excess ground, and that's it. Simple like that. But of course, it's a lot of work. You see, like, and the last 15 months of all of our life. So um, how it works is you have a liner over here to give a rough mapping of the room, and then um, the computer will be able to recognize ground type starting with the WCF. So this is part of our proprietary algorithm technology to set this up a bit to recognize our lines. That's for the um that's for the software for the hardware we have our um our grounding mechanism and also our swan job uh cleaning mechanism that can tilt to the side, which is not available in this version. So how it creates value is that a human only needs to press a button and it goes and also to below ground by pushing this up, taking out the nozzle. And so we don't want to have a water thing behind over here. Okay, that's one about who's then after working on ground, cleans up itself, cleans itself, and come out. 
So that is um, that's what the human needs to do. So one human can thus basically manage about five robots because it takes like five to ten minutes to change the water and and then press the button and then uh, move on to the next robot. And so that's how we be become a skill. The robot itself though, is at least as part of human. Currently, based on the latest run, it's about double the speed. So um, before I do the demo, one of the things that we'll want to look out for right, is how nicely the, uh, the robot can count the floor lines. And so um, over here you have what we do is on our test page, we will take out the floor tiles and then we'll see how deep the ground actually went. That's quite important because um, if the ground is not very deep and very surface, like how a human can do it and show and pretend that they know it's done, um, the, um, the ground will actually fall off very quickly. So this quality control is very important and we also call, uh, and we also will tell our clients to check our robot based on uh, based on the quality standards. Um, and at rest and I can tell them that rest of the robot will not sky very well. Okay, so I'm doing some demo videos. Um, so this is this is our version two robot, and um, this was with the largest contracting company in Singapore, Goma. Um, you can see the crowding robot, the crowding mechanism over here, and the cleaning mechanism over here. So it's really extruding our ground and cleaning our ground, and that's it. So, um, and this is the version two. Okay, it's rather large, and it was it's also a lot more messy when coupled. And for the version three, we actually condensed that to a PCB board, more on that later. And that actually helps us a lot with debugging and making a lot, a lot of things smoother. Because this was just a breadboard and it was like an integration now. I mean, this is still integration now, but that is more of that. So, um, and you can also click left and right to, to cover the corners. We really straight that for the version three because um, in the because we want to focus on robot sensitivity, make sure it works very well on the central line, and also because the corner lines, even though it exists like in this particular unit, it's not too common. So we will just let this go on a time video. And then just on QC, we may to get a dry run of the whole um of the whole living room. So there is no problem over here, but you can see that the robot can autonomously move between different places. Sorry, different, oh my God, okay, different parts of the living room. I'm just fast forwarding it very quickly. It looks like it, it's traveling rather, it's traveling rather slowly, but for perspective, this whole living room um, took about uh, close to 40 minutes, 30 plus minutes, whereas a human would have taken two hours because a human would need to continually rest or like clean, clean off the and stuff like that. Yeah. Right, clean up the uh, the route. Okay, so this is a bit of So this is a bit of a history of our uh Hungary. So we actually started off in the Czech Republic and Germany. You can see where we are. There's no. So this is the version one, and it's in the snow before. I'm very proud of it. We this is in a in an Airbnb in Germany with ten homes. So we actually started off the first time when we actually had a somewhat early prototype was in, in Jacob's house in the Czech Republic near Prague, and then um we were actually just setting up simple mechanisms. So we are really we are testing out our most basic assumptions in design. And then slowly we are like starting from a grounding mechanism to a grounding mechanism with photo extrusion to then with uh, on, on wheels and then to then with remote control and then to then with autonomous driving. So it feels like that so that in case like our well, most fundamental design choices shift, we do not carry on with that design choice. So anyway, this is a D1 grounding and D1 grounding and I ran out of these three days. And then um Jacob got this pizza and then we built our video robot in my house. Um and then so and, and, and yeah, this is a V2 robot. And it was back it was in Singapore. Uh, Jacob has been living in my house since um last December. Um and then um now the V2 robot. Fortunately, we have our own place, like my parents also this other than the B because later you can see like all the little tools in my um was in my house previously. Okay, so this is the stage of uh, on how we fabricate our robot. 
Anyway, the whole idea of this um, talk is so just to tell you how to you know build a hardware company from ground up. And we can do it and get these as well. We only need like too much space sometimes, depending on what you're doing. So it's like they start off with CAD and then followed by citing citing the CAD and then pretty much in troubleshooting. Especially troubleshooting is very difficult. Uh, medical fabrication, electrical assembly, audio coding, and education robots. So we're starting off with canning. Um, yeah, so this is our CAD lesson. So yeah, can you do 360? And um, the a good thing about Fusion 360 is that it has three startup licenses. So that helps a lot because otherwise it's very expensive. And then if you use an education license, right, there could be some IP issues because you're you know, supposed to um, be part of the school that you're actually doing about some bit. So don't risk it. So you have to do something that you know is meant for free for startups, and then you own the IP. And then afterwards, we take we save as mesh and then we export it out to an STL file and then we slide it. And then uh, and you can choose the whatever settings that you want on um on on the mega graph for it and it converts to a cheap code and you put it in the computer. Again, this is not a pretty big lesson. So um pretty printers here, actually pretty printers are rather cheap. I think you guys how, how many of you own 3D printers at home? Or oh, oh okay, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so 3D printers are rather cheap. Um, can I guess, uh, can I have another setting? What, what 3D printer do you need? Oh, I didn't buy it, but I built it. It's in a hydro cube. Do you know it? Oh, okay, that's like a DIY version of the 3D printer. Wow, okay, that's how much did it cost you? Million euros. Oh, okay, how big is the lens? Oh, that's a one of the slides. Oh, that's this uh, that's the type. Yeah. Okay, that's nice. And how about you? Ah, okay. And you bought it for 200 plus? Uh, around 400 days for the video. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. But I, um, if you put in enough promotions and buy during like the 1111 sale and stuff like that, it's quite cheap. And then you need to just tiny it properly. And then there is the rule is true love element. The reason why we are doing this is because there are a lot of Intricate parts of the gear that we require, um, like we will make support, we will make support to the pain. I remember for me, one day I spent like, um, unlike the technician, so I spent, I spent one day to remove support for one part. That was horrible. Um, yeah, so P, like using PBA element would be helpful. Wait, sorry, and does anyone know what PBA element is? Okay, good. So then, then you can learn something. So, tell me, you um, so the reason why you want two extruders is so that you can extrude two different materials. Or if you are main, you can extrude two different colors, but you don't have all that. So um, two different materials. So PLA is the most standard form of, um, of plastic that is usually used in 3D printing. And a lot of this are PLA. And then um, PPA is poly, polyvinyl alcohol. It's basically in what's in your type of. So it's somewhat edible. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's like they mean non toxic. I have to tell my parents that hey, we don't sign like it's non toxic. Um, yeah, anyway, so the reason for, for you using that is because you want to use it as a support material to, um, like, so, so that you can put it in water and it will just dissolve. And so you don't have to spend a lot of time removing spots because 3 printing is just basically depositing filament from the top, right? So then you need support if you want to, like, say, build a bridge or build something that is suspended. Yeah, so PBA is perfect for that. Um, other uh, elements that we use will include like PEG, which is the material in your uh, plastic bottles, um, PPU, which is basically printable rubber, uh, nylon, and carbon, carbon fiber like nylon. Um, we haven't really used much nylon. Anyway, so for, but for PPU, what we, we use printable rubber because um, we need to use it as a primary cap to push out the ground. As you can imagine, like, if you want to push out water, um, and, and you need it to have a reasonably tight surface um, in the base, then we use PPU. Another reason why we started using PPG is because we realized that like um, PPG is a lot less corroded when it's all less damaged when it's in contact with rocks or any other chemicals. So um, that's why, that's something that we just realized afterwards. We didn't know that before then. So it's a bit of a and error. Yeah, anyway, I will introduce you to this three printers. It's like a thousand, less than a thousand dollars here. It's a thousand five dollars. Uh, um, and three hundred mm by three hundred mm by three fifty is rather large. It's like um, they print a very decent, decently sized part. 
But yeah, so um, this woman I was holding at home previously, you can see that two of my stuff is at that top. And then um, you have a good shot here, which is um, supposedly very reliable, and then you can, um, yeah, and then you can bring also the random materials, but um, it was funny because he, he, he likes a lot more than I do. Really is just expensive, and I um, but you see, it's not going to buy saving money on everything. Yeah, we have to save money on everything, and these are the kind of other things. I'm not going to see this. I'll try some. Okay, I don't know why it's like this, but I tried to okay, a little bit. So it's basically so this down. So um this is basically the three printer printing. Oh my god, why am I so unstable? Because this light yellow thing is the PDA, and then um and you have two extruders, one containing each filament, and then the other thing is the PDP of the LA, that is the actual body. Yeah, so just now the FP transmitter is a kind of type. The first one that you saw, this one is the kind of three. Okay, here's the part. So I buy a lot of things too. So it could be like if this is an angle grinder. Does anyone know what's a what an angle grinder? No pants, maybe don't be nice. Oh, okay, that's good. That's good. The angle grinder is what, is what you use to cut metal, right? And uh, surprisingly enough, they allow they allow this kind of stuff to be delivered to house. Why not? So uh, it's three forty five dollars. So anyone if you guys want to get it off, like visit for some of the you can do it. It's very it's very very good. It's extremely loud. And then you have a band grinder. Again, always like all this stuff, I'm gonna cheat a dremel to um to cut off whatever you cut off if you make an error you And then you have electrical tools, um like soldering iron and heat station can be as cheap as 100 US dollars or I don't know whether it's actually or not. Yeah. So this is some demo of us using some of our tools. I hope it will work out and I see what will work out. Uh, okay, so this is uh, our guy doing band drilling. We need to get uh, we need to get holes onto this aluminum extrusion so that we can fix them together over here. And then like later have an overview of our office. It's at one off by the way here. So it's quite close to here where all the um, startups are. At JVT Launchpad. And then we have someone, we have uh, a member doing soldering. And we have a um, fume extractor for health reasons so that we don't get cancer. <laughs> and then this is the rest of the office. This is our kit to test out our robot. So we set up house there and then we put walls around it because the robot needs to look at the walls around. Um, it's still better recognized loss, so we need to go out virtual walls. And then there's the rest of our office. You can see we have a rack that we have three meters, like three levels of three meters of the same speed. So it's about 800 square foot of space. If anyone wants to come, just feel free to drop by. Um, and like we always have to go see anyone on, on this. Yeah, so you just put all this not long ago. Um, it used to be a 400 square foot of space, now it's about 800 square foot, slightly larger than this, I think. And then angle grind. I don't think I have audio for this one, but I can just tell you it's very, very, very loud. So yeah, I mean my, my neighbors used to put up with this at the my house, right? But we do it in the daytime when one at home. So uh yeah, you can see it starts like and then you just fly with the wall. It's cut you like it's not like butter, but it can't be. Um, yeah, and then um, that's how we fabricate our metal parts. Yeah, but there aren't too many metal parts to fabricate, fortunately. So, yeah, the angle grinder has been helpful for us. Ventilate when when using one. So really, aren't you mentioning like use blocks when using an angle grinder? Ah, so different people are different. Okay, like that. 
I'm just going to be looking at like the first and if you need more dangerous, you can even if it gets smaller. Yeah, correct. So I don't know, but we have like level nine cut this is the love. So even if it's cut, it's not supposed to break. But it means more trophy, so would it? Do you feel like I find it safer to not use gloves if I know the hand can't get anywhere near it? Because something getting grabbed by the angle grinder is usually worse. But if I know that I have a small piece I need to grab and then need to hold my fingers two centimeters away from the angle grinder, then yes, really use gloves. <laughs> And also, it gets really hot. Like, it makes a lot of friction and goes into it. Um, so, yeah, that's an idea that we use us. If that's really bad, I think it's very close. Yeah. And then, uh, has anyone used high cat before? Oh, that's nice. Okay. So, um, like, okay, have anyone touched a bad board or used a bad board before? Okay. So, uh, the reason why you have high cat is to replace bad board. Like, uh, simply, simply put it. Because if you have a red ball, sometimes right, like um, something fails, you have 1,000 components and something in the middle of 100 components, something fails and you don't know why, you could just be a spit wire or just be because your red ball is bought from, because I bought the cheapest red ball from Trumpy. <laughs> and so it doesn't work out. Yeah, that happens a few times, by the way, because I was like, oh, look at the cheapest stuff, it's so, <laughs> a little bit of use. The red balls we had were from a reputable <laughs> European shop, so. Ah, okay. Yeah. So at the same time, yeah, expensive doesn't mean good. Cheap doesn't mean good, expensive doesn't mean good. So just get cheap stuff. <laughs> anyway, this is my head. Uh, it, it allows you to model different electrical components like um your cycle motor very well. No, you don't you don't model it. It's just that usually you want to create some circuits on redboards to understand how it needs to be wired. And then you just transfer it all into uh, the schematic. Then you draw the schematic onto the PCB, and uh, then it's just going to be a lot more reliable because fire is going to just run on the ball. Like yeah. here, we're, like everywhere, we're using locking uh, locking connectors to make sure that uh, like even if the robot vibrates a lot, the fires can't fall out. Yeah. So you can see the um, amount of we have in the version two is way more, it's like three times more wires. So it's a defining help because like sometimes one piece of wire can fall out and you don't know why. Yeah, if, if you're using wires in something that's gonna move a lot, really recommend using servo wires because they generally have very thin spreads of copper in them. While like if you use wires that have fewer thicker strands then just by uh just by moving a few times those the figure strands can break more easily and it's really hard to debug something when you just have a lot of wires and you think one of them is somewhere in the middle broken and it's not visible so we had a lot of debugging now because of that um, and another thing about debugging is that actually if you're building a robot for the manufacturing or construction industry especially the construction industry People are going to mistreat it. Like, as uh, I told our advisor, which is a head of new products at Ozen, um, they were saying that like, people don't pee on the robot and they don't like the robot to take a look over his electronics. That happens before. So, your robot has to start to kick through pee pee. Well, now it's not the people, but you know, you get the idea. Like, it, so not, it's not just about engineering things to work, but also engineering things to work in real life and by people who try to solve us. That's very important. And so reliability is something that is maybe not the sexiest thing to think about, but it's definitely necessary. And then this is again economics. So uh PCB board. Have anyone ordered PCB board before? Okay, that's nice. <laughs> so you can put it on PC wave. I'm not advertising advertising for PC wave, but like a similar company can work. And then we thought, oh, how much has this cost? So actually 10 pieces of our main board cost like uh 257 US most of these sites have, like for a small board that's only double sided, you get 10 pieces for five dollars. Um, is the standard price? Like this is like 200 dollars for the 10 boards, but it's just because it's four layers, extra thick copper, and some stuff like that. 
And how many people are shipping? I think that's in the weeks, right? Yeah, for the simple ones, they ship in two days, for the more complex in the week. Yeah, that's oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been then arrived within the uh, week after that. Yeah. So that's something that we consider when we do web prototyping. I mean, we, we could have done this, um, I guess, if we. And a lot of them give like small amounts of money to students. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so um, how much money do you need to start your own, to build your own robot that works in the industry? So this is how much we had two 3D printers back in Europe. Um, and then like we bought some materials for robot. All this like USD by the way. So we just multiply by one point four uh, as of the day, right? And then um and two three printers like other mistakes to but the build of materials of our robot, we spent the an initial amount of um, three thousand four thousand Singapore dollars, sorry, four thousand US dollars. And then when we moved to Singapore and it was at my house, we spent a bit more about um close to ten thousand US dollars to buy seven to buy seven three printers, a ton of tools and a ton of uh, materials for uh, to build like our um, version two and to iterate and when you don't know what you're doing to start you will burn a lot of stuff so you have to come on that as well. So therefore the build materials of our robot is three to four things is actually about two eight. And then the primary our robot cost is actually um including assembly which is just uh, approximately 4k USD and the most expensive stuff of our robot is um not too expensive actually we have two of these so called motor controllers we have one liner that costs 100 USD and then we have respiratory pipe which uh the cost now ranges a lot I think now it's like quite expensive right like 200 USD for the gigabyte one uh it sucks yeah but I, I used to buy more I, I bought a good hunch for um uh, 400 uh, I know I'm going to buy it at a uh, zero price for the sheet. I'm kind of that happened so loud. Uh, yeah, and I'm still a student in one class. I haven't, I haven't like concert, so I have my student details I uh, until for the next month. <laughs> so it's been a year last week. Um, yeah, so that's good. Um, yeah, and then we have SpongeBob. So this SpongeBob costs about less than 50 HDD. Um, and it's a uh, consumable because you know it will wear out after some time. Um, so we change a spawning of air twice a month or slightly less than twice a month. And so um, that's the monthly recurring cost. But it's really not that much, especially when compared to labor costs. Like $100 a month is really nothing. Okay, so one of the things that we notice about hardware startups is the difficulty of the, easy, the gap between getting people to trial your robot and getting people to actually pay for it. And so, especially in the contract industry, whereby, whereby people are a bit more controversial. Um, which is also part of the reason why we ended up, um, which is also part of the reason why the productivity was settled in there. So, um, therefore, we start off with grounding as a service, which is essentially just us being a part of the director. Anyone can do it, you can do it as well. It doesn't, you don't require some um, cert or whatever, or, um, or any form of approvals to be a subcontractor in Singapore or grounding. Um, and therefore, like, we are just going to cut based on the amount that we do. Which and it's just slightly cheaper than the market price that at this current rate we'll just get contracts very easily and really bad. Um, especially because people um are lacking labor right now because of COVID, which work a lot in our labor. And then afterwards, when we build up our reputation and when we learn from our mistake and eat our own shit by using our robot, then we can move on to other forms. So then we can move on to the rental model and then sign for eventually that is more scalable. So we have really found our pattern, we've been funded by our profit Cambridge, and then um, we also been funded by our construction company in Singapore BHC, but it's a very company. And then um, like right now we're just um moving on to the service model, we start with the main reading and report the whole reports. And so um this is how our unit economics worked out. The labor cost, we are able to cut out like 80% of the labor cost, and given our small, very little robot cost. We're able to get a market margins of more than 50%. So our robot cost over here can actually be just dividing it. This is per day, by the way. So like I'm just assuming that the robot uh, has a lifespan of side over a year in this case, which is very reasonable or rather an, an underestimation of the lifespan and the overestimation of the depreciation. Even so, it's able to make a huge amount of uh, gross profits. Yeah, and then the main matrix of the tracking is the net productivity ratio, which is for each person 
how uh, using n robots where n is the largest number of robots the person can make, how much output can the person produce relative to another person? So one is where you want the parity. Of course, there's still users, but it's online is useful. And then our target is to be checked in stock. And um, at HR, we are about one or close to one. Um, and then we are moving on to find that, um, like hopefully by the start of next, uh, by, the, by Q2 next year. So our team consists of Jacob and Southern Model. We actually live together or co together in Europe. So uh, like we haven't, we haven't thrown things at each other yet, even though we did pretty much our life with, with each other. And then I'm a living Jacob since from um, this and all of us. And more as we are for um, a month actually, he just got back not too long ago on Tuesday. So kindly we have we are traveling with um HCC Moha, so I will draw that attention that amounts about 30% of the Singapore market and allows us to get net revenue of about 2 million SGD per year. And other partners of ours include Eddie, one of the largest crops of islands, uh, and the base of water, IPI and OSG. So, in the long run, we want to use reinforcement learning to help us reduce our developmental costs. And how we do that is to use this as a starting point to collect data, and that will fit into our simulation model for us to test out our computer hardware design and speed up our iterative process. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And we will ask you any questions. Okay, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Don't be shy. Okay, then I can ask asking people questions. Does anyone want to start with, who, who do you want to start with companies? Come on. Okay. <laughs> Before you, the most important thing about starting a company is that you have to be shameless. You really have to be shameless. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm going to shake your butt or something. Does anyone who's their own companies or anyone follow that? Thank you. Yes. Um, does anyone have anyone like worked on hardware projects for that 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 you know, sorry. Uh, do you want to share what you have used? Yeah. 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 So this is basically we want it from a simple feedback of this way. Okay. So we have stuff like for our capstone project, we had to build a laser tag system. Except it did it wouldn't just be a laser tag system, it had to have gesture recognition with machine learning, and they, they gave us the worst microcontrollers possible because the good ones made it to me. I asked the prop, this is actually the reasoning she gave me. Because I don't know how to be able to really static with the but I rest of, yeah, yeah, so I ended up doing the hardware stuff. So I designed like three printed guns. It's oh. pretty, I couldn't go on to the universe because I was afraid I'd end up a waste or something. <laughs> but then I 3D printed the guns, the best for this time for the best to detect them with the hardware inside it. I wish I could do a PCB, but not enough time. I just sold it on to like the board. Yeah, oh, good. Spent like a hundred dollars on batteries because I was like, nah, let's buy the most expensive energy to live here. Why not? It's not my money. <laughs> yeah. It's so, only people think this too. Yeah, that's yeah, still but it's still as in like we're still very frugal in the way that things like how we I also there was once where I where I went to the when we were moving on this and we were throwing, throwing a lot of stuff out. And then I went to the bin center, there was a perfectly nice chair. I was so tempted to just take it away. I mean, like, but but you know, we do things like that. Yeah, we could have taken the we could have taken the chair. Like it's a ruler chair that seems to be right. <laughs> like this chair, right? I mean like if this chair didn't happen, then it's not like a random form. Oh well. I mean you did say you have to be shameless. Yeah, that's true. Okay, right. Let me share what you all. Okay. Oh, it's, 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 so, um, but these projects were made for a 
So, or before I was sure that I was going to study CS, so I love uh, adding new projects and also just printing. Um, so I don't know things to do there, guided calendar or something like that. Um, yeah, like that. The, the 3D printer was actually printed with another 3D printer. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else. Nothing. Another purpose. Okay, which I also mean that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Rucha, the shop has like a thousand Rucha's in their warehouse printing more Rucha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You know, everyone has some kind of thing about questions. Does anyone have any questions? If not, I guess we can have yeah, yeah we can have like a ten or fifteen minutes intermission, then we would open up next time. Yeah, okay, it sounds good. That's that all we call it kind of all okay. okay. So uh, for this presentation, uh, we will be working with three different very, very common data sets. And that's the classical data set of uh, the distinguishing between cats and dogs. And uh, second data set will be uh, detecting UR elements. And third data set will be distinguishing whether object is a hot dog or is not a hot dog. So when approaching such a such an such a problem as classifying dogs, uh, cats and dogs, uh, like I first create for myself uh, some data set, as, as you can see, I have a data set with different web scraped images of cats. I have also the same data set of web scraped images of dogs. And I want to use transfer learning. So I start with a model. Uh, with a ResNet 50 model, which is quite small, but should be sufficient for, uh, for this problem. The main reason why it's sufficient for this problem is because it's trained on ImageNet data set, which is a collection of like 10, 15 millions of images from 1,000 different classes. And among those classes, there are different types of cats and different types of dogs although the specific tag for cat or dog is missing. And uh, when training on this model, I basically just cut off the head, the, the, the last one or two layers, and replace them with, uh, with a new one or two li uh, linear layers to predict with uh, softmax to predict, to predict the categories that I want. My data set is something like 360 images for train set and 460 images for test set. This is very reasonable because since we are using so little data, we are mainly interested whether the resulting model performance that we think it has will actually translate to real performance on, on real data sets. So actually having data uh, test set larger than train set. Uh, makes sense in these settings. Most of the performance will be gained by using the pre-trained model on the huge data set. Okay, so I just naively apply the the apply the model to the to the train set, and wouldn't you know it? We have perfect 100% uh, accuracy model in just a single epoch. Like, isn't that amazing? All cats are classified as cats, and all actual dogs are classified as actual as actual dogs. Okay, but because we are good data scientists, we test the performance on the test set, and yeah, the, the performance is worse. So we are like naturally thinking, okay, let's throw some data augmentation on it. Right, like we have just not even 400 images for training. So even though the model internally should have the representations of cats and dogs 
quite figured out. Let's let's prevent it from overfitting just to the test set, uh, just to the train set, and let's throw some data augmentation on it. So we go into the default data augmentations. Here I'm using fast AI library, and we can simply just switch everything on, right? More data augmentation is basically always better. So we do some random flipping, rotation, changing the lighting by 90%, 10 times zoom. Just throw everything the library has on it. And the performance is worse, even on test set, the train set. Hmm. That's that's weird, but okay, we made the we made the task harder. So what's the performance on the test set? Oh shit, it's 61%, which isn't too good given that it's basically binary classification just between dogs and cats. So one pounders. What can be the problem of having uh, such a shitty performance? Actually, much worse, given model that basically already was able to recognize cats and dogs perfectly before training on uh, before even training the model. Hmm. So good things to do at this point, and that we skipped, and that was the first common mistake, is not to visualize everything that you are doing and coding which is a bit harder for NLP, but is like very trivial for computer vision. Oh, hi, Ronald. Um, if, oh, hi. Yes. Um, are you able to close the table of content so that uh, it's a little bit bigger on our side? Uh, should I close what? The table of content, the sidebar. Oh, OK, sure. Yeah. Nice. Okay, it's better now. Thank you. Oh, let's look at the images we were using for training. Ah, I see the problem. I recognize this, this as a dog would be quite easy. This cat is almost unchanged, but just from this uh, green smudge or a piece of grass, one wouldn't really recognize whether it's a cat or a dog. Maybe if we were classifying between dogs and dolphins, then grass would be quite suspicious uh, for the dolphins. But we've messed up the data augmentation. So what we can do is to actually think about each of the parameters during data augmentation and whether it's reasonable or not. So uh, zoom should definitely not be 10, 10 X as the default, but something more like 10%. And also rotation, depending on your task, whether you want to uh, classify dogs doing backflip or not, should probably not, uh, not also like exceed 120 degrees. Doing something like flip vertically. Uh, again, if we were classifying numbers, and six and nine in most fonts would be the same number for the model if we were randomly uh, flipping among all axes in the data set. So now that we realize that actually we cannot just throw all the different uh, normalization uh, data augmentations on the model and we have to be careful about how much are we cutting out, are the images still recognizable? We just apply it again to the to the data set. Now, correctly look at the augmented images, not only on the images before augmentation. And after a short look, we can assess that the, the images are definitely recognizable and the deep learning model should be able to, to train on those images. So are we right? OK. 98.8% accuracy on the on the train set. Okay, makes makes sense that some image would be incorrectly classified. So we said that we see that one actual cat was classified as a dog. I would say that that's very good performance for the model. But the more important is about test set, and test set has reasonable 
83%. On the test set, it would be even better practice not to apply the data augmentations on the test set, or at least also see the results on the test set without the data augmentations. Like ideally we would apply the data augmentations just to training, maybe to validation and uh, leave, the, leave the test set as it originally is, because we may be actually messing up stuff by the random data augmentations, even for the test set. Okay, so we went through using transfer learning for bootstrapping our model on and training uh, computer vision model even on few hundred images, making it more robust with reasonable data augmentation. Let's use this pipeline and just throw it on a different data set. So our second data set are UI elements. We start from the same image, from the same model, ResNet 50, pre-trained or ImageNet. And we can see we have, we have three classes. We have buttons, we have icons, and we have inputs. I agree that like the difference between button and inputs is a bit isn't that well defined, but this is what the this is what we were given as a task in our uh, in, in some random imaginary company. Actually, it happened to me once in, in the last six years, and so just scrape enough images from the from from Google and or some other website and let let the model let the model classify. Like all the noise should reasonable cancel cancel, uh, cancel itself out. So the true representation of what icon is by the internet standards should should be extracted. Okay, performance on train set is only 80%, which is which isn't isn't great. Uh, I would say that that shows that the the model wasn't really able to to get big portion of the big portion of the data. And what's even worse, that the result on the test set is around 50%, which for free class problem sure isn't totally random. But you can see that uh, the buttons, the, the predictions of buttons, are very messed up, uh, very much messed with the with the input class, and that the icon and buttons also are uh, not recognized too well. Like, what can it be now? Our data has reasonable augmentation, like the model should be able to recognize icons however they are rotated, right? It should be able to, to recognize even images with a few small cutouts. So what can be the problem? I certainly cannot interact with you and like literally ask you, so please uh, think for yourself what the problem is. So well, first problem is that the, the, the data set itself isn't of a, of a high quality. Like you can see there is some like even description of how to design inputs instead of just input cut out uh, from some website. But I would uh, argue that the biggest problem is the model we used, the pre-trained model we did the training on. Because the model was trained on images of natural objects, cats, dogs, birds, chairs, people, candles, etc. And uh, the, the layers, the pre-processing, the feature extraction learned by this model isn't really applicable to web elements. Like uh, when going through much, much of the research and especially going to activation maps showed that Deep learning models trained on normal images are most interested in the patterns of the image and not as much as by the shape of the image. So how does the fur like, uh, how, how does the fur of the animal look like? Like, is it wood? Where is the wood? Which 
it doesn't really scale out to uh, to UI elements, which are mostly about the shape. That's their main differentiating factor. So naturally, just by this, we shouldn't expect high high performance of a model that was pre-trained on a completely different domain. That is the that is the domain we are trying to to train on. Train on. Uh, another problem is that UI elements are of multiple scales, of multiple different sizes. So it would be better to use something like a multi multi-dimensional uh, model, which which basically when it does when it does uh, convolutions on the model with with strap, it predicts on multiple different zooms effectively. And that can also greatly enhance the performance on something as different as our as a UI data set. And from my experience, from the one project we did a few years ago, using using the multi-size model, multi-zoom model, was really really beneficial, and it made the model basically achieving almost 100% accuracy on UI elements. Okay, so. Now going back to to the or to the third problem uh, and third data set that we are supposed to to train on, and that's hot dogs and not a hot dogs. That should be quite straightforward. Applying ResNet fifty trained pre-trained on ImageNet seems like reasonable choice it's like hot dogs kind of probably the the image that has some food classes in it already so it should that should apply well our run, randomization or our data augmentation that we apply as you can say see are also reasonable right like pizza should be recognized as not a hot dog however it's rotated random small cutouts also do not obstruct basically anything. So we didn't we didn't fall for any of the of the previous errors. And let's see. So the performance 94% on both validation and uh, train set. That's great. Just like two misclassified uh, hot dogs and not the hot dogs. Most of the not the hot dogs are actually pizzas to make it easier to create a data set. What about the performance on test set? Mm. Under 80%. That, that, that's weird. Why is it why is it so confused? Like when I did uh, so well on the on the validation set, which the model also didn't see, you would expect the result to be like within five, six percent, maybe. We have quite a small data set. The validation set is like one quarter of the size of the test set. So like there is there is more room for like having really settling on a model that just by chance does very well on the validation set. Hmm. If you look back at the images, there is there is one weird thing about the classes. Again, I will give you uh, a few seconds to think about what are the what are the differences between the what, between the classes and what might be messing up the model that it performs very well during training but then has significantly lower accuracy during the during the test set but i also have to be showing some more some more images
Right now, you can see. Uh, I hope that you can see that most of the images in the train set that are not a hot dog are, in general, quite blue. And all the images in the that are hot dogs are mostly shifted to red. So, whereas if you look at the where if you look at the test set, it's the other way around. The hot dogs are mostly in, in blue view, and the not the hot dogs are mostly in a red view. Okay, so here it was obviously created on purpose this way to to show to show the problem in, in a clear light. But like, how do we how do we realize that this is a that this is a problem? This is what's messing up the the models uh, in real life. It will be something more subtle than like whole view like change the overall the main color of an image. Right? Like there was the one case where uh, doctors thought that they have perfect model for uh, detecting detecting lung cancer, and it showed up that actually in the training set. Uh, all the images were with patients that actually had lung cancer had a small measuring, like a piece of measuring device that was visible on the X-ray, so that they can then measure the size of the tumor and, and like see its size progress over time. Yeah, and this is this is the main thing the model focused on. But when they put it on the patients that were all like didn't people didn't know whether they are healthy or not, <laughs> the model never saw. The, the measuring device, so it predicted that all the patients are healthy. So, how do we how do we see whether uh, what's the problem? Is we use activation masks. So fast AI has has it quite easy to to plot the activation masks, uh, but it's very easy to also do in, in TensorFlow. So if you are, for example, creating Keras models, and uh, here we can see the overlaid activation mask on the on the images that had the best predictions on the train set. So we see the model most the, the most uh, weight that influences the the prediction, which means uh, there are multiple ways. There is like technique. CAM was the original technique I know of, and the newest technique you should search for is GRADCAM, which basically looks on the uh, how do the gradients in the in the first or even later layers influence the the changes in the output in the output class. And here we can see that in the in the images that were very well predicted, the main thing the model focuses is are the the bulls and the sausage itself. And then if you look at the images that were very, like, that were incorrectly predicted, we see that the model just like looks at random leaves or, or something or like on the, on the place in the middle. If you investigate the, the best images from the tester, like here we see that the model doesn't pay much attention to the blue in the, in the background and really really gets gets the classification from the from the hot dog but when we look at the worst predictions we see effectively no activation now looking at those four worst like most incorrectly classified images think again whether you can see some some pattern that causes it to have effectively zero activation towards towards the correct uh, towards the correct class yeah they are drawings right which was again done on purpose so although people would agree that they are hot dogs and this is probably hot dog and this is definitely a hot dog. I don't know what this is. Uh, 
for the model, since we had no uh, drone images in the train set, we cannot expect any reasonable predictions in the test set, especially since the pre-trained, since the data set the model was pre-trained on is again from a completely different non-drone domain of just normal, normal images of objects in the wild. Okay, so we can, we might say, okay, sure, we use the pre-training, we are changing only the last one, two layers. Uh, yeah, th th then it cannot really ever learn to classify correctly images as are those, because it, we, we, we don't let it, right? Like we don't let the model to change the weights of the, of all of the important layers at the beginning that do the pre-processing. So if it's a different texture, like obviously it cannot work out. So last thing we can try, yeah, let's let's just let's just un unfreeze the, let's un unfreeze the model, completely, so that we the model has access, uh, not access, the model has the ability to update all of the weights in the model, not just the last layer or two. And yeah, we can see 90% accuracy on the on the train set. That isn't the best, but like reasonably, uh, like definitely it's, it's like 10% better than it was before. Hmm. But we see the problem immediately when we evaluate it on the test set. Because especially now that we unlock the model to look for, for whatever in the in the image, because it like, it can completely change the weights. One thing it overtrained, like almost certainly overtrained heavily on the images, because it could, it was still shown just the four hundred images with okay random random modifications, but the modifications were quite mild, and uh, then when we evaluate it on the images that have the completely different view, like actually switched view, yeah, it didn't perform well. So we can again look at the activation maps, whether my, my prediction is reasonable. And the best, best predicted images, you can see it. Okay, it looks at the pizzas, right? Because as I said, most of our non hot dogs were pizzas. And, uh, yeah. During the and this time during the the prediction, the, the most incorrect predictions you can see are much more certain that it's the other that it's it's the other prediction and they just look at the random corner of the image, like here it just looks at a piece of blue in the corner and says, I see a piece of blue. It's not the hot dog. Okay, so now. To summarize uh, what we've learned or what I hope I showed like reasonably uh, in a practical manner is that uh, using pre-trained models is a great way to, to, to have a decent deep learning model with just a few hundreds of images. Uh, but the domain of the model has to be similar to the to the image we are classifying. So using ImageNet data set, like some model pretrain or ImageNet data set is great if we are like detecting people or random pipes in rooms to be grouted. Uh, but isn't so good if we are detecting URL, UI elements or pathogens or, or cells in a, a from from laboratory. The second thing is when we are doing random uh, random augmentation, we should always check whether the augmentations are reasonably reasonable and think about whether we are not, for example, merging some classes as can happen if we did something like number classification, which is a solved problem. But let's say we want to do something that has some symmetries and actually putting this into the pool of augmentations then would mess it up or I can think of if we were predicting uh, like 3D geometry, like directly from an image, we want to predict the, the 3D position in space compared to the camera, then probably doing uh, doing random warping of the image isn't a good idea because we would also we should also warp the label 
of that image, which definitely is computable, but it seems like a, a lot of pain. So it's better if we stick to random crop out or changing the lighting, the, the hue, etc. of the image. Um, and then the last thing we explored is heat maps using techniques like CAM or GradCAM, which uh, can really help to see why is the model uh, failing and they can help with discovering some problems usually in the data itself that the models were trained on. Okay, that's everything for my presentation. Uh, now, can we somehow arrange uh, questions? Questions over the Zoom. Say any questions? Yes. Oh, it is one. One thing. So the presentation. Do you have any clear reference between, say, PyTorch and TensorFlow? Okay. Please can somebody <laughs> write it into a chat or something? PyTorch and TensorFlow. Oh, whether, whether to use PyTorch or TensorFlow. Uh, I think they are merging together. So they used to be very different uh, frameworks, like six years ago. One worked well, and the other was easy to work with. And now they are, in my eyes, they are almost the same. So like at our project, we are now trying to use the Google Corel uh, board to accelerate our deep learning. And then it's it's obviously quite like, like straightforward to go with TensorFlow because you, you need like 10 lines of code to try to change the model in for this ball to compile it for this uh, deep learning processor. It's possible to do with PyTorch models, but like why to do at the hassle. On the other hand, for PyTorch, if, if you are if you have some models that are quite new, like not, not something like ResNet 50, I would expect there to be better implementations that are more readable or even just exist in PyTorch. So then going with PyTorch and starting from somebody else's implementation seems like a good idea. Any other questions? Okay, then uh, thank you for listening. I hope I showed something uh, and enjoy the rest of the talk.